Hello and welcome to another episode of the No Bullshit Property Podcast. I'm Paul. And I'm Howard. And we are not joined by a guest this month because uh, what a month it's been. Quite a lot has, has happened out there in the uh, the world and the economy. A budget, then a reverse of a budget, a prime minister, a new prime minister. So we thought we'd we'd spend some time this month talking about the effects of recent events on the property market, the property industry, you know, what we see as potentially happening next, what effects we've already seen in the market. So, so yeah, so you're just going to have the pleasure of the two of us this month. So, Paul, where do you want to start? I mean, what, what's the highest priority thing to be telling people about in terms of the property market? Well, I guess what we've seen is is a few different, well, not so much changes, but a few developments over over the last few weeks. I mean, we've talked about this in our episodes before, and obviously my favourite subject. But again, the word on everybody's lips is utilities and and the cost of utilities and how people are much more educated now. I guess I think if we look at compared with now a year ago, would you have analyzed your electricity bill like you do like you do now would you understand the cost of everything and what we're seeing in our tenants um as soon as we put property on the market are that's what they're asking you know what tariffs are these apartments on are they fixed can i change it and likewise today we actually we put property on the market yesterday and and available properties are hard to come by at the moment so for everyone you put on you get 100 phone calls a day and we got people cancelling viewings today because they didn't realise they weren't all bills inclusive properties so you know people are looking for different sorts of products out there and they're very sensitive about their outgoings and and not committing to things until they've understood all that which is it's very different to kind of the where we were a few years ago especially pre-covid when you know the manchester lettings market people moved every single year you know your average tenancy was 12 months people moved around they wanted to be in the latest developments we're not specifically seeing that now because people are afraid to move on because the rents are so high and they're being driven up by demand but they're also wanting to fix their costs longer over time. So we're seeing people want longer tenancies. We're definitely seeing the average tenancy increase. And, you know, people are aware of the fact that it's hard to get on on the ladder to own their own property. So people are renting for a lot longer. Yeah, I mean, probably another reason as well people are renting for a lot longer is is what we've seen happen in terms of rents Mm -hmm. the various industry reports out there right moves uh suggesting that our our home city manchester asking rents are up by over 23 percent over the last year there was uh another article out there saying that rents are 40 percent higher so yeah perhaps that's another reason why people now are wanting longer longer rental periods as well mm. because it's it's unprecedented the the levels that, that rents uh, are, are at and the, the percentages they're rising by. Yeah, it sure is. And, and like I said, people want to be able to forecast what their outgoings are going to be. We're, we're in a market where, you know, from one month to the next, things are increasing. You know, your electricity is increasing month on month. We're now going into winter where we're at the higher price points and and we're going to have more usage and people want to understand exactly where their outgoings are going and and what they've got left (laughs) especially in a city whereby if you're in a city such as Manchester part of wanting to live in the city centre is wanting to enjoy what that brings you know the nightlife and everything that goes with it so you know people very much want to understand how much they've got left as disposable income and what we are seeing in some people is they're willing to move out of the city into suburban areas that are a little bit cheaper old trafford being one of them where they're close enough to the city where you can jump on a tram and you can still enjoy that nightlife but they've been outpriced out of town basically mm-hmm. and uh yeah, they can stretch the salary a little bit further in those areas. I mean, the, the, the kind of strange situation that we've we've got facing us now is normally when, when rents rise so dramatically, you'd see less people choosing to rent and people then looking to buy because, relatively speaking, mortgages are more affordable. But 
we're in a situation where the opposite's happened. The cost of mortgages has just risen dramatically because mm. of the uh, the rise in interest rates, and then beyond that, the uh, the fallout from the the budget that was announced. So we have this strange situation where even though rents are rising dramatically, people can't then go, do you know what? Rents are so expensive, I'm going to look to buy because their mortgage repayments have suddenly just become a lot more expensive unless you've got a, a significant deposit to put down, which many many people don't. So that's that's an interesting dynamic. And yeah, it's interesting to see what effect that has on the market. I mean, you know, the obvious thing is that it means people are forced to rent if they haven't got those sizable deposits so you know one of the things we're anticipating seeing is well people are actually going to rent for longer and you know not not just necessarily apartments in the city but even moving to that next stage of your your life where you're having a family typically you'd buy a house in the suburbs i think this a recent set of events and the recent rise in interest rates is only going to accelerate that whole trend, which was emerging anyway, of people being content to rent for a longer period of their life. Uh, you know, it's 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 pretty pretty common in in mainland Europe that people will rent into their forties or or indeed you know their their whole life. For some people, mm. will will rent, but we've never really had that that mentality here in the UK. But this right now feels like it's going to accelerate that shift to me. Yeah, it does um, make you think about shifting your mindset and, you know, having a mortgage myself that's going to come out of a fixed term next year. It is a worry to me of what that's going to be. It's it's the unknown at this point, especially when you've got accustomed to your way of life and, and you know... <laughs> quite honestly a lot of people have debts have cars everything else so you know that's a big it's going to be a big factor so if you can fix a rent for a longer period of time than you can actually be able to fix your mortgage mm. then it's a, a very real option mm-hmm. um, and what do we think current situation is doing to commercial property and, and tenant demand and landlords perception of, of the market well i think you know, we're now in a place where we were pre-COVID, whereby there's no sanctions anymore in terms of chasing rents and chasing arrears and bad debt. You know, we're back to a place where we were beforehand, where, you know, legally you can chase everything in the, in the same way you could before. I think now's the time we're going to see business, some businesses fall into some trouble because there isn't the COVID relief there. They might have took bounce back loans on top of that and they've now got, you know, their COVID holidays to pay for, the bounce back loans to pay for, an increased electricity supply to pay for, as well as, you know, we know that business rates will be reappraised next April, which could potentially increase as well. But likewise, from a landlord's point of view, you know, these building owners need to get their money you know they're in the same financial position as everybody else but people who own buildings still have mortgages and and outgoings elsewhere and they're they're able to now aggressively chase that debt you know whether it be statutory demands on people you know take it through the courts and you know let's be honest everybody wants to get that cash flow in the other side of the coin is you know it might not be easy for these landlords to relet those spaces, especially prime city centre office space, because, you know, businesses are thinking about downsizing for the, the same reasons. So when a landlord previously, you know, if a tenant was in trouble, might have forfeited that lease to get this to get the stock back on the market. You know, let's be honest, it could now not be in their best interest to do that because keeping them in under their lease obligations is is revenue that they can chase so yes there's a few different different strands to it really the other thing of it is i I do think this um the cost of living crisis will force people back into the office because you know the cost of them working at home now (laughs) it may be much more beneficial for them to be in the office so yeah there's lots of moving parts to it yeah i think that's an interesting one i mean we've seen it on a on a small scale so far, the the impact of the higher cost of heating your home, of you know running your electricity, and we were talking to one of our tenants who set up their their employees to work from home with some fairly energy intensive kit because they're a, a design agency, 
and those people who wanted to, to work from home for the benefits of you know reduction in travel time the benefit of, of being at home and working from home etc etc what, what's their perception going to be now do you want to be paying for mm. running all of this expensive kit and the electricity costs that go with that or do you want your employer to be uh, paying for that and and actually therefore have the the hassle and expense of going into the office mm. so it's interesting to see if this increased cost of living is actually going to to push people back mm. into the office like you say versus working from home and covering the costs of of energy during the day being at home and beyond that you know the people who perhaps during covid moved out of the city to move into a property with a garden and more space and therefore were wanting to work from home more days because travel times were longer travel expenses longer are we going to see a reversal of of that trend as well Mm. yes i mean interestingly i've read something recently whereby there's a prediction that some businesses may may work in a hub um, and actually people work from home working against that electricity supply so that they can still maintain working remotely but yet you know they can essentially tap into the the office resources to combat you know the the cost that is involved in that so is well, that, that, s- that that means a business is then taking on an extra liability of, exactly. a, of a hub somewhere away exactly. from their main office and Again, with the economic uncertainty, it's difficult to predict mm. which is the right way and, and which way is, is going to get traction. I mean, the thing that, that we're still seeing is there is still demand from businesses for commercial space, leisure space as well, mm-hmm. which you know seems, seems crazy sometimes uh, that we're still seeing demand for leisure space in you know, Manchester and Liverpool, despite all the headlines of cost of living and inflation and... Yeah, people are still clearly going out as much as they they were, and that's driving the demand for for leisure space. But where's that going to give? Mm. I mean, we were saying the same, weren't we, a few weeks ago, that Manchester just seems to be absolutely, um, you know, thriving from a, a, a nightlife point of view. And you do you do wonder if there's just a mindset with all the negativity about that people just want to go out and have a good time <laughs> yeah yeah mm. also you know we're fortunate to be to be based in a a big city like manchester where perhaps it is a bit of a microcosm it is a bit of a bubble where people who do live in the city typically are you know they don't have families they're they're young professionals as we're saying it costs a lot to live in the city so you must be earning a a reasonable salary to be able to afford to so maybe that isn't actually then reflective of Mm. of the wider world the wider uk outside of the big cities but certainly if you you know landed on on this planet from mars and landed in manchester or or london or, or any of the other big cities you would not believe that there was any sort of cost of living crisis or any sort of cost of debt crisis because it's it's busy every day of the week still so we've talked a bit about impacts and and what we see as impacts on the on the property market from from cost of living i mean we were going to talk about the impact of the budget but a lot of that's been reversed pretty much all of it's been reversed since it was was announced one of the few things that's remained at least in the short term is the cap on energy costs for for businesses and individuals but it it's got me thinking about you know all all of these tax cuts were announced and the the market reacted very very badly to them and that's uh, been a big contributor to the place we find ourselves in today but it it got me thinking about you know is there any way that property can be taxed better is there any way that you know there could be the scope to to make tax cuts for for people whilst raising taxes elsewhere and you know we're, we're not a we're not a political podcast we're not political commentators but you know taxation within the property industry probably like a lot of industries isn't quite a perfect fit and uh yeah i mean what do you think is there better ways that that property could be taxed i mean sdlt 
other alternative taxes, council tax. You know, the, one of the things that um, the Boris Johnson talked about before coming into power was was moving SDLT um, from from the buyer to the seller, which in theory sounds like it should create a saving for the buyer. You know, okay, first time buyers get get relief anyway, but it is always an additional extra over cost. If you're not a first time buyer, you're in some way being penalised for buying a property, whereas typically it's the seller who's making the profit, mm-hmm. make the profit when you sell. So in theory, moving SDLT to the seller actually would be a way to make taxation more efficient in the property market. But if you're doing that and you're moving it to the seller, it's the seller who, in most instances, is setting the price. So it's almost self-defeating because the seller will just add on the cost of the SDLT to the price. So, you know, that was a pre-election of uh, Boris Johnson. One of his main thoughts never came to pass because it, it isn't really efficient. I think for me, one of the the ways that the property could be taxed better is, and I'm saying this as a, as a developer because it's a, a very real challenge that we face as well, is a holding land tax whether it's in place of SDLT or instead of, or, you know, there's some kind of blend, you know, one thing that holds back the delivery of housing is speculators buying land or buying properties and sitting on them and doing Mm. nothing with them. That's holding back the delivery of new homes, which is meaning that there's the shortage of supply, which is meaning that rents are rising like they are. So... You know, if a government wanted to look at a way to to raise taxes that affected a specific group of people who are not utilising resources, then then that for me would be a, a really effective way to do it. If if you are holding a property or land that is not being utilised, then you could be taxed on it. It's a good idea. Is that your idea? <laughs> I think others want to run for office. <laughs> <laughs> also, just a disclaimer for probably just my friends who are listening. STL, uh, SDLT is stamp duty land, ta- land tax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's not. I don't think it's entirely my idea. I may have read it somewhere before. <laughs> Someone may have had it before. No, no good ideas original. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I was reading just today with the new Prime Minister some reflections on the property market and, you know, the delivery of, of new houses each year and, and the housing crisis. And that sounds like a, a really effective way because, yeah, you're exactly right. How much how much land is out there and doing nothing, especially in, in this in in the world we find ourselves now where it's quite difficult to get things out of the ground <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and and part of the problem is is land costs if if there's no incentive for a landowner to sell they will sit and wait to mm-hmm. get the price that they want to get whether that's realistic or not and you're right with the the pressures we're facing as developers right now with you know, build costs, construction costs rising over the last eighteen months to 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 incredibly high levels, and then on top of that, the cost of debt rising dramatically because of interest rate increases. One of the the few areas that there is the ability to to try and reset that balance is land prices, but you know we're not really seeing that happen. So, a holding land tax that that for me would be part of my uh, my mini budget, and hopefully I don't crash the bond markets uh, when when I announce that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, obviously we've we've had all of this this fallout, and we've seen the effect it's it's had on people's ability to to buy property. So, yeah, for me, that that's a way to to counteract it. If I was was chancellor right now, holding land tax. So, I'm going to ask you a few questions Go around on. that. Go on. So, just yesterday, we we have a new prime minister. As a developer, what are your hopes for for the future now? I think one big uncertainty that, that's lingering is there's been talk of, and this is getting quite technical now, Getting the, there was talk of scrapping 
the need for local authorities to deliver a five-year housing land supply. Now, that to me, again, is a bit disingenuous because we need more homes. We need to have the carrots and sticks to push private landowners to to sell to local authorities to have the motivation to to grant planning permissions even if you know the politics for them might be a little bit challenging you know there's a lot of places in in the UK where you know people are, are sensitive about new development so there needs to be the carrots and sticks there to ensure that development can continue even in slightly you know controversial areas where where locals are not supportive of it removing the five year housing land supply would would remove that incentive on on local authorities if they don't have targets to hit then they're more likely to be swayed by political pressures than the pressures of of delivering housing which ultimately the the country needs as we talked about the rise in rents is you know partly to do with the inability to go and buy properties but it's mostly to do with the shortage of supply of properties so i think that needs to be clarified and that needs to be maintained as a as a policy there needs to be those kpis for for local authorities to to ensure the delivery of housing so i think that's that's top of my wish list mm-hmm and what do you think it means for, for the northern cities and, and specifically the northern powerhouses? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see whether the, the government commits to previous agendas, levelling up funds, the long-forgotten HS2, which never seems to get talked about that much mm. anymore, and you know what many perceive as even more important than HS2 is the Northern Powerhouse Rail. So ensuring... We have got a special guest tonight, sorry. Uh, ensuring that, that that is... Very vocal about the HS2. HS2, yeah, we've mentioned it <laughs> and uh, just uh, just remembered about it. But yeah, ensuring that those those previous policies and pledges uh, remain committed to and that they aren't swept under the carpet or the funds that are intended to go towards them don't get diverted elsewhere because they weren't necessarily the incumbents policies yeah it's an interesting time isn't it i was actually thinking last night that um certainly never in my lifetime have younger people (laughs) as much as anybody known so much about politics because you know we've been through a situation whereby during covid we had boris johnson on our televisions every day everybody is very invested (laughs) in in the government right now for a number of different reasons but probably more so than ever before and confidence is at an all-time low i think Everybody just craves a bit of stability right now and it will be, there's certainly a big job to do, but it'll be interesting to see how how things unfold going forward. Interesting is one word for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Scary <laughs> slash interesting. <laughs> I, I think the, the, the thing for, for me is, you know, the, there's always economic cycles and... You know, we've gone through a cycle of growth in in property prices that has gone on longer than most cycles typically tend to. And we thought COVID would be the thing that that caused prices and, and rents to crash. It didn't. I'm not saying they're going to crash now necessarily, but there there appears to be this this change in momentum. But the the, the positive for me is. You know, I, I I started my business and I, you know, sort of cut my teeth in the economic uh, crisis of 2007, 2008. And we are a very long way, how it feels today, from how it felt back then. The We're entering a period of a real strange set of events that have all happened um, over a fairly short space of time over the last two years an unprecedented set of events but it's not like it was back then back then the capital was just sucked out of the market and the market just froze because of that we've not seen that 
now to the same extent and you know back then there just wasn't the capital there from the main participants in the market the banks were over leveraged the 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 sources of capital it was too concentrated now we've got a lot more players in the market they the main banks aren't as over leveraged there's private equity in the market so it doesn't feel like there's going to be that same freeze up of capital like there was last time there's been a a pause for breath but it doesn't feel as dramatic as then so so that's the the positive for me is that yes there's a an unusual set of circumstances all come together and happened at the same time but it's not a case of there's just no capital in the market does that mean we're going to have a a, a nice easy ride and it's all going to be happy and, and rosy over the next 12 18 months no but you know as a as a nation and as an industry we've we've faced challenges before and we we get through them so yeah interesting times ahead to to use your word <laughs> right well thank you very much pleasure so let's hope for the next episode we've got two left this year Let's go for a bit more of an upbeat uh, subject. Definitely, definitely. Look, there's a lot to look forward to. And, you know, one of the outcome of this is, um, you know, all the, uh, the the agendas of, you know, moving to a low carbon economy. The, the cost of heating and electricity is really forcing us to accelerate towards that. So, you know, that that's a positive outcome of this. And yeah, I think even our uh, next episode or the one after is, um, is going to be about new opportunities going into the new year and the opportunities that are coming out of this situation. So upbeat, positive, next time. <laughs> thanks for tuning in today to the no bullshit property podcast if you like this episode let us know on instagram at cert underscore property and let us know what you want to see more of don't forget to check out certproperty.co.uk where you can download the latest uk property news and our investment guides and if you like us on where you catch your podcasts please subscribe 